Okay, so I'm Judy Hertz. I'm the executive director of the Midwest Academy. I am really delighted to be with you here uh, tonight. Uh, the Midwest Academy, we're passing brochures out, but don't look at them till later. Uh, we are a national training institute for community organizers, for progressive community organizers. Uh, we train primarily staff, but also leadership, how to organize to pass better public policies and corporate policies in the United States, primarily, not only, but primarily. Uh, and we work, as you'll see when you look at the brochure later, but not now, uh, that we work with a wide variety of organizations from small neighborhood organizations all across the country uh, to big national organizations that you have heard of, like the Sierra Club or the ACLU or uh, the NEA. Uh, community organizations, labor unions, wide variety. Okay, um, I am here tonight to talk to you about uh, strategy and how a bunch of technical experts and hackers could be useful to community organizers uh, who are trying to change the world. Uh, I am going to show you a tool that we train on from coast to coast uh, that is a simple but deep way of planning out a campaign strategy. So you're mad about something, you want to see a change, how do you think about plotting that out? And what it really is, is it's all about power analysis. And the area that community organizations and labor unions and others could use some of your help is in finding the information that we need to do the underlying power analysis. So I will point that out as we go along. Uh, okay. So when you are addressing a social problem, there are lots of different tools that you could use. Community organizing is not the only one, and it's not always the best one. Uh, they're fairly self-explanatory, perhaps. Uh, they're on a continuum because they actually run into each other, and they're not as separate as they look up there. And the main thing I want to say, so social services, so if we're helping homeless people, for example, that's giving them sandwiches and shelter and other things. Uh, we do research and education to learn more about problems, put it together and educate people about it. Uh, sometimes research and education doesn't work. And the primary time when it doesn't work is when we're up against some big powerful entity uh, that uh, decides they don't want to see the change we're trying to make. So we've done a lot of work with groups working on clean indoor air ordinances, no, so half of you aren't smoking and the rest of us aren't breathing your smoke. And uh, that took arguably 50 years, five decades, from the time that we knew that breathing secondhand smoke would cause cancer to the time that we were able to start passing those laws because the tobacco industry has a lot of power. So when you're up against a lot of power, having the facts isn't good enough, right? And it turns out, by the way, I don't know if we have any PhDs or other highly educated people in the room. I'm guessing we do. It turns out that the more education you have, the harder it is to believe me when I say that. Um, global climate change is another example, right, where the other side just makes up its own facts. So what to do when the other side is making up its own facts and when you, you know, something is perfectly clear, we need a change and you can't get there, then you have to start to develop power. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, advocacy is when you use the research and education to start advocating for something. But organizing is when you actually get a whole bunch of people together and uh, they get to define the solution and they build power to get their solution implemented. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to show you how we think about that. And the last piece on this uh, chart here is to show you that if you're over here at the social services end, you're probably not attacking the underlying power imbalance that is causing the problem, right? One of the reasons we have economic inequality in this country is some people have way too much power and a whole lot of other people have way too little power, right? Uh, and feeding people doesn't attack that imbalance uh, and organizing does. On the other hand, you can't go to a homeless person and say, don't worry about eating, I'm organizing. And in five years, you'll have all the sandwiches you'll need, right? That's ridiculous. So we need all of these tools. We just need to know when which one is the one we want to use at that moment. So here is the Midwest Academy strategy chart. 
Uh, it is uh, in five columns, and I'm going to go through each one of them individually. And what I want to say before we get started is that they're wired together like a spreadsheet. So if you change something in one, it changes all the way across. Um, and this is a very simple but also very deep way to plan out a power analysis and an issue campaign. This has been used to stop George Bush from privatizing Social Security. Um, and I also, since Daniel isn't here, I can say this, I, I made a presentation to his eighth grade class for career day. Don't think his teacher quite knew what my career was when I got invited. Um, <laughs> and we figured out how to get better school lunches. Uh, so simple, but also deep. So a definition of power, the word power means 101 things, and that's fine. When I use it tonight, this is what I mean. The ability to get somebody in the policy arena to say yes to you, even though they don't necessarily want to, right? Uh, by cutting a corporate uh, a person's profits or by cutting an elected official's votes. So those are the primary ways that we go about this. So here we are. Um, this is column one. So column one is goals. Here we define what we want to win. And we can split it up here. We're talking about uh, raising the minimum wage. We got this thing we're fighting for, uh, $15 an hour, right? And if we think long term, that's leading towards a livable wage for all workers, right? And we want to keep that long term goal in our mind because we're really not just fighting for 15 bucks an hour. And a short term step to that goal would be to get Representative Smith to vote yes if we're trying to pass this in the state legislature. Okay, now this looks really simple and obvious in this room right here. You would be surprised how many efforts flounder because they haven't defined clearly enough what they want. Or how many uh, times an effort puts things in this goals column that are not what they want to win and so they're getting 500 people to their meeting and they're getting a petition signed and they're getting a whole bunch of other activities done but they haven't got their eyes on the prize. So this is eyes on the prize. What are we trying to win? And as you can see, let me make a, a comment about uh, this being a spreadsheet. If we're trying to win, uh, let's say we were just trying to get the minimum wage up to $8 an hour, we wouldn't have to have, or up to $9 or $10 or $12, whatever it is, we wouldn't have to have anywhere near as much power as we would have to have in the rest of the strategy chart if we're trying to get it to $15. And if we were trying to get it to $20, that would require even more power to be represented in the rest of the chart. Is this making sense? Yeah? OK. So this is organizational considerations, column two. This is a very clumsy way of saying, what do you have right now? What are the resources you're bringing to this fight? Right now, we have how many staff? How many leaders? How many members? What's the, what do the social media lists look like? What's your reach? And not just numbers, but do they reach the key communities that you need to reach into? And not just how many staff do you have, but how much time does each of those staff people have to dedicate to this effort? And even more so if it's volunteers, right? How much time, how much can you count on them? What are people really going to be willing to put in? When you are not honest here, this is when everybody finds that 200% of their time has suddenly been committed to something, right? Have you all ever had? 200% of your time committed, right? It's not fun. As you go through the chart and figure out the rest of the strategy, uh, you're going to be coming back and saying, oh, yeah, and then we're going to need to add this to our organization. We want to ha we'll have an opportunity to add more members. We'll get more volunteers. We'll build up our social media lists. Uh, we'll bring in some money, and so on and so forth. So here in this column, you're planning for building your effort like a snowball and getting bigger and bigger. Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, many efforts that we all may have been part of, where you start off with this robust group of people who are ready to uh, take action, and three months later, two people crawl across the finish line. This is where you plan not to have that happen. Internal conflicts here, you got two people who can't stand to be in the same room. You make a plan right up front for you know, keeping them uh, on different pro parts of the project, or whatever it is that you need to be worried about that's going to come up. Now, here's the heart and soul of the chart, which is the people power, the constituents. Um, 
Who cares about the issue? Who can you recruit to be involved with you? Who do you already have in your organization if you've got an organization? Most of the groups we train are organizations. So they're trying to build their organization bigger as they go through this campaign. And we have to think about, and we'll get uh, to this much more specifically in one minute, what kind of power do they have over the target? Now the target or decision maker is the person you're trying to get to say yes to you, okay? And then how are the people who uh, care about the issue, how are they organized? Can you find them already organized? Has somebody got a list? Or uh, is there an organization? Is there a club? You're trying to find senior citizens. You're not going to stand on a street corner looking for people with white hair, right? Because that's very slow. A lot of them are dyeing their hair these days, right? It's, gonna be, it's not going to be worth your time. But could you go to a religious congregation? Could you go to senior housing, right? Now you've got a nice group of them. You can make friends with the president of their club. You can then have her or him tell the seniors, hey, we need phone calls now, right? You've got a whole cluster of people organized much faster than doing it one by one. On social media, you may be able to get a very large group of people doing it that way. You want to figure out how can you segment the list? How can you figure out who's taking more action? How do you pull those people in? How do you start to build relationships, right? So that the people aren't just sort of one-time people who, who clicked a button and then they vanished. So building this up over the course of time and people who the decision maker is going to be very nervous about, and I'm going to say a word about that in a minute. Well, let me, let me jump into that. So um, the decision maker, this is column four. The decision maker is the person who has the ability to say yes or no. So let's focus here on an elected official. So you want the elected official so you want to identify who it is. You want to figure out, uh, in a legislative body, you may have to do some digging down and figuring out who's taken which positions, who's with us, who's against us. And then in this chart, we're usually going after those swing voters. Now, I'm going to be honest, and you've probably noticed this about American society. We're a little polarized right now, right? There are not as many swing voters as there were 10 years ago in any legislature or legislative body that I know about, right? Uh, that makes it much harder to do our job, and it means that we have to dig in harder on more people, and frequently what we have to do is we have to dig in really hard on the ones who are against us and figure out how can we make enough of them uncomfortable that we sw swing a whole bunch of them. That's, a, that's a, another topic. But so we're figuring out here who it is that we're going after, Decision makers are always people, not institutions. Uh, when I was a, a young organizer, I made just about every mistake that I could think of so that I'd have stories to tell later. Um, and how many of you are renters, by the way? Raise your hand if you rent in Chicago. So uh, there is a thing that you may know as the Residential Tenant Landlord Ordinance, <clears throat> but back when we passed it in the 1980s, it was called the Tenant Bill of Rights. And it completely ch changed. It brought Chicago up from maybe the 1920s to about the 70s or something in terms of where we are with the rest of the country um, in, la in la la landlord-tenant relations. We were fighting for the tenant-landlord Bill of Rights for a lot of years before we got anywhere. And uh, one of the mistakes that we were making was we had assumed that we were going after an institution, the Chicago City Council, you all probably know there's 50 members of the city council. We hadn't named any names. We got this piece of paper and it said that we had to name names. Uh, so this is back so far in the deep, dark past. I know this will be shocking. We had to go to City Hall to find out all of the names because there was no internet and to get maps. And we realized at that point that we literally had no base in the neighborhood of the key people on the Chicago Buildings Committee in the City Council. Okay. And that's why we were losing, yeah. right? I was taking people, I, I was the executive director of a very large and powerful tenants' rights organization in the 49th Ward, Rogers Park. And, but no matter how brilliant an organizer I was, the uh, City Council member, the alderman from the 44th Ward did not care. I could take five people from the 49th Ward or 5,000 people 
down to the 44th Ward, and he literally didn't care because they couldn't vote for him, they couldn't vote against him, they weren't gonna give him money, right? So we always wanna hone in on who's the exact person, and remember I said, what is the relationship of power? What power do they have over the decision maker? I'm using decision maker and target interchangeably here. We used to always say target, and then somebody suggested that maybe it was rude or sounded like maybe we wanted to shoot them, which maybe we do, but uh, we still were, we're calling them decision makers. Uh, same thing here, right? So what power? So, if you're, so here's one of the downsides of a lot of social media organizing, right? Uh, when we did a study of this at the Midwest Academy, we discovered a, a large number of people being asked to state an opinion to uh, a governor of a state that they lived five states over from, right, or a congressman who they, you know, they didn't live, not only didn't live in his or her district, they didn't live in his or her state, okay? The people they most want to hear from are the people who have uh, the, the possibility of voting for or against them, and who they really, really want to hear from is the people who actually might change their vote based on this issue. So if we only organize the usual suspects ourselves and we go in to meet with a, a congressman and they look at us and say, yeah, you're not going to vote for anybody else no matter how bad I am, right? Or you're not going to vote for me no matter how good I am, right? Then they're not too likely to be nervous. What we're trying to do here in this column is scare the crap out of the decision maker. We want the decision maker to think there'll be really serious consequences like not getting elected again, right? If they don't do what we're asking. And so we have to think really seriously and figuring out who those voters are, who ought to be taken into the room, or is it possible, the other thing that scares the crap out of them, is when suddenly there's twice as many people ready to vote against them as there were in the last election. So figuring that stuff out and showing it and not just saying it, right? Can we get some numbers? Can we figure out uh, who lives in the district? Who are the swing votes? Who, if we activated them, you know, might, uh, um, might be ready to stand with us and scaring the crap out of the decision maker? Okay, is this making sense? So it sounds clearer in a room like this than it necessarily is when you get out into the real world, right? And when you get out into a congressional district that you don't live in, you're organizing around a state, you don't know exactly who's there. The other thing that really matters is you need to know how the district is changing, right? The numbers often tell you what was the case five years ago or four years ago or 10 years ago, right? And what you need to know is what are the numbers going to look like at the next election, right? Uh, and where are the people who could make that difference, right? And if you can figure out how they're organized, you know, are they in associations, are they in, you know, groups, some way, some way that you can get them, right? So the more specific you can get, one of the things that I say to, to organizations when I talk about power is what we're trying to do here is really dissect it and put the pieces out on the table so that we can look at them. Right? And that's a place where I think you all can probably be very helpful. I don't know a lot of organizers who are really brilliant at dissecting election results and demographic results and, and getting as deep into it as I wish they would. Um, opponents, this is the people who are against you. So going back to the Tenant Bill of Rights fight, uh, the opponents were the landlords. Okay, and you don't really in this chart want to waste a lot of time on the landlords. The landlords didn't get to vote in the Chicago City Council, right? What they got to do was, well, um, I and my uh, colleagues were talking in this year of a city council person, right? Then the landlords would come and talk in this year, right? And we, if we were good, would be bringing votes, and they were generally bringing piles of money, right? Um, and we had some very, very fun actions in which we uh, revealed how much money they had been bringing. This is another area that is ripe for uh, uh, f figuring out um, exactly how much money are they bringing, who are they giving it to, 
Uh, one of the most fun things I did was take a giant garbage bag, clear plastic garbage bag full of Monopoly money. Uh, I, I don't think we probably have too many people in the room who remember Eddie Verdoliak. Any, anybody in the room remember Eddie Verdoliak? So I was part of delivering to Eddie Verdoliak, who represented all that was evil on the Chicago <laughs> City Council. Am I right? Yeah? Yeah? Um, and, and we took this giant garbage bag full of money and told him we wanted to buy his vote. Uh, we didn't get to meet with him, but the media was all there and they were eating this all up. And even better, um, his receptionist was there. And I don't know exactly what the woman thought, but when she saw this giant garbage bag, clear plastic garbage bag, full of pink and green and blue, like Monopoly money, she started screaming, you get that out of here, you can't come in here with that. And I have no idea what she thought, but anyway. Uh, we need to have the facts. Uh, we had some, in fact, information about how much Eddie Verdoliak had taken from the real estate lobby. So uh, opponents, though, what we didn't do was we didn't spend a lot of time attacking the real estate industry. Although, it's also interesting that if we had pointed out from the perspective of the real estate lobby, how much did a particular company give to the city council, that might have also been really interesting. We didn't have the capacity to do that. Lots of organizations don't. That's a, that would be a really interesting uh, um, exercise also. Uh, we uh, neutralized is a word that has been pointed out to me has more than one uh, meaning, some of which, you know, e eliminating them entirely, but uh, we didn't do that, although uh, ha had we had enough power, maybe we would. But what we did do was we discovered that half the landlords in the city were big landlords, half the landlords in the city were mom and pop landlords. The mom and pop landlords weren't the problem. We rewrote the bill. So if you live in a building with five units or less and the owner lives in the building, you're not covered by the Tenant Bill of Rights. But we wouldn't have been able to pass it if we had been covering everything. So again, what I'm talking about here is dissecting power and spreading it out on the table. Who are these people? What do we know about them? How many? Who do they give money to? Who do they talk to? Where are the buildings they own, right? All of that stuff really filters into this, and we do way too much guesswork in the field of organizing. All right, so the decision maker, I said, the person with the power to give you what you want, um, not an institution, always an individual. You can't build a strategy chart and a power analysis on an institution. It's got to be on an individual. Because what moves one individual doesn't necessarily move another one. right? Uh, and you've got to uh, look at the, the district, and one district is different from another one. This is the bottom line. We have to do a power analysis that helps us understand how do we get enough power that they're shaking in their shoes and ready to get us to, you know, to say yes to us to get us to stop, right? And, uh, and votes, and sometimes exposing their shenanigans and other kinds of things are, are uh, very important ways that we can do that. So when we're going after somebody, we got to know if they're elected or appointed. If they're elected, I'm going to show you in a minute some more uh, data. This is just the beginning of it. You all let your imaginations run wild, what you might want to know. We at the Midwest Academy, we have a five-day training session for organizers from around the country. We're doing one actually next week here in Chicago. And we give uh, the 50 people who will be there uh, a challenge to investigate a particular congressman and we just you know we give we divide them up into teams and give them topics and and one of them is just fish around on the internet and see what you find <laughs> right um, and you would be surprised or maybe you wouldn't actually um, and if the person is appointed then we want to go back to who's the uh, elected official who appointed them and how do we hold that person responsible uh, often when an appointed official is doing bad things they're, they're put there, that's part of their job. They're there to take that kind of flack for the uh, elected official. So the mayor gets to sit up there looking clean and good and all that, and, and the appointed official is taking all the crap. Uh, this is the, just the bare beginnings of figuring out you know, the, the, uh, the data, uh, the election results. And of course, you don't want just the last election results. 
You want to go back several elections. You want to see what the trends are. If you can find the registration data, you want it because in this particular case here, we've got this fictional guy. This is actually a real guy that my coworker has changed all the names to protect the guilty. Um, and, and Ed Lux looks like he's a safe Republican if you look at these numbers here, although it looks like he's less and less safe. Uh, but if you start looking at the presidential race, he doesn't look quite so safe. And if you look at the voter registration data, you see that this isn't a safe district at all. So can we start digging down further and figuring out how we can move this guy? There's almost always something down there that we can figure out if we keep digging. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, uh, of the hundreds of organizers that I train in a year, not enough of them have enough time or enough expertise to get too far down into the information. So um, I was doing a training on the strategy chart a couple, two years ago, three years ago in the state of Kansas. And uh, one of the people raised their hand and said, you know, this is all well and good, Judy, but this information is really hard, if not impossible, to get in the state of Kansas. And fortunately, the person who had funded the whole thing was sitting in the room. And fortunately, she was an enlightened funder. And she said, you know, I think I could take care of that problem. And uh, so here is the Kansas Civic Fact Book uh, that she funded that put together in one simple place all of the demographic information and the election information and the outline of the, of the uh, um, a Senate and representative districts, right? And so it's the beginnings of exactly what you need in order to start to dig down on these guys. Uh, and here's a, a quick example. If you're going after a corporate target, there's a whole different set of information that you might want to look at. Uh, and there's an organization nationally called Little Sister. Anybody familiar with Little Sister? That specializes in digging out uh, corporate research and, and has a website that I understand encourages sort of collective research into corporate uh, uh, information. And again, it's even less likely that the average community organizer can begin to dig into this stuff. All right, and then after you've done all of that analysis and other analysis, I see I have another slide that I didn't put in here, uh, which is looking at the weaknesses of decision makers figuring out, uh, are they, is there a scandal brewing about them right now? Uh, have they stolen money? Uh, I, I leave scandals to our imagination. We don't need much imagination to think about scandals in Illinois, right? Uh, and so that's another set of information that's really useful to lay out on the table, not necessarily to use in the most crass way, uh, uh, some groups that I speak to are, think that that's a great idea to rush out with the scandals and other groups are horrified and appalled and I've been almost run out of at least one group for suggesting that they might do that. Uh, but let me tell you just a really short uh, vignette about a time when it really worked in Illinois. Uh, anybody remember uh, Governor George Ryan? Yeah, and Governor George Ryan who was selling driver's licenses to truck drivers who hadn't passed tests and weren't qualified to be driving big rigs on the highway. And at a certain point, one of these guys who had bought a license and hadn't earned it uh, uh, crashed into a van uh, with six kids in it and they were all killed. So George Ryan, one in a long line of Illinois governors who was on his way to prison. Uh, but at the moment that this organizing happened, he, uh, he still was the governor, had one foot in prison, but still, still in the governor's mansion in the way that you can in Illinois. And the coalition uh, to stop the death penalty realized that the governor was looking really bad and not headed anywhere good, and that he might want to have a better legacy. And he was a pretty old guy at this point, so he was not going to come out of prison and uh, get any better legacy. And so they had a conversation with him, which was probably nowhere near as blunt as this, but this is basically what the conversation was. Governor, you might like to look a little better than you're looking right now. Here's something you could do that would be a very positive legacy, and we'd be happy to polish it up for you and tell everybody how great you are if you would put a moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois. 
And this was at the point early in the time when uh, more and more people on death row were being found to be innocent, right? And uh, Governor Ryan did that, and we, that was the beginning of the end of the death penalty uh, in Illinois. Now, that scandal was really obvious. Uh, it, we can figure out how to <laughs> dig around. What are the weaknesses? What, is, what are the vulnerabilities? Uh, another piece of information that a group that I was working with discovered, working with a group in Aurora, Colorado, they wanted to get their school superintendent to provide materials in a lot of different languages. I think they had 50 different languages in their schools. And he wasn't cooperating, and they couldn't figure out how to get to him. And the school board was elected, but it just, there just weren't enough vulnerabilities. And they dug around, and somebody uncovered the piece of information, seeing patterns, which is what you all do, right? Seeing patterns that uh, school superintendents in Aurora and similar sized places, cities, tended to only stay about four years. And then they either went to a, they got a promotion to a bigger district, or they ran for office, or went to the corporate world, or you know, somehow got promoted. This guy in Aurora was coming up on four years, and so they were able to use that that piece of information let them know that if they let loose, if the high school students in that town made it clear that this man didn't know how to control the schools he had, nobody liked him, he was you know, not doing a good job in Aurora, he was never going to be able to get that next job, right? So, so you never know exactly what you're looking for until you find it. Tactics is column five. Now. For a lot of people, when you think about community organizing, you think about tactics, right? You're angry about something, you go out and hit the streets, you pick it, you, you protest, you make phone calls, you get an online petition, whatever it is you do, right? But if you do the tactics first without doing the analysis, you might be doing what I was doing all those years ago when I was going after 44th Ward Alderman Bernie Hansen with people from the 49th Ward, and Bernie Hansen did not care. Right? So you have to do the whole analysis first, and then you use the tactics to build your base of people who have some power, a relationship of power, with the decision maker, and to show off that power. Some of the tactics build awareness, build momentum. The Women's March, for example, built enormous awareness and momentum and energy, brought a lot of people into the movement, right? Um, showing power directly to the decision maker, you name the decision maker, back to our column, uh, first column, Representative Smith, we have all these people from your district who are writing to you today or phone calling you or standing outside your office or whatever the tactic is, asking you to vote yes for $15 an hour. Right? And that's a partial list of tactics, but tactics are only limited by your imagination. Point being, tactics come last. Um, just a little word here about style and tone. Um, I asked a question in a training session once about, uh, we're not winning yet, how are we going to go to the next level? And, and the response came back, we were going to be twice as loud. So being loud, being militant, wearing Robin Hood hats, uh, that's tone and style. Right? And it's not the same as power. Power is having twice as many people who can vote or not vote for the person, who buy or don't buy the product of the corporation. Right? Um, but st uh, style and tone liven things up and make it fun and make it memorable and make it energizing. So they're very important, but not to be confused with power. So here's the last slide. This is the chart. This is how it all fits together. The people in column three do the tactics multiple tactics, a variety of tactics, to the decision maker, right, the target, in such a way that the decision maker wants you to go away badly enough that he or she says yes to your ask in the goals column, and the whole thing ends up building your organization. OK? Now, that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and it sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't work that way because the people who are working it haven't dug deep enough, haven't got enough facts, haven't laid out enough pieces on the table to sort through. So maybe uh, connected to your style and tone uh, yes. topic, but 
Um, one of the hardest things for me uh, when I was working for the Northwest Neighborhood Federation was getting used to being sort of rude. You know, we would insist on things. We had to be very aggressive. Yes. Um, it's hard for a lot of people. Yes. Um, yes. Is it just a matter of practice or? <laughs> Uh, yeah, to some extent it's a matter of practice, yes. It's a matter of getting over the idea that you should be polite. It's, it's you know, kind of getting together with your neighbors and rem or whoever is you're working with and reminding yourselves that you have a right to be mad, that you're mad about something righteous, and that, you know, when we have really bad situations in our schools, when kids are working with textbooks that are old and falling apart, that's very rude. When people don't have enough food to eat, that's very rude. When people's housing is falling apart, that's rude. And so for us to stand up and speak back about it is not rude, it's what needs to happen. You mentioned some of this data is hard to collect. It seems like we're kind of falling over data these days. Why is it so hard to get data on these uh, like individuals or especially public figures? Mm. I think part of it is um, time, and people don't always have the time to get it. Uh, organizers are very frequently busy getting the people engaged, and they're not as much oriented towards the data. Sometimes the problem is making sense of it once you've got it. Sometimes the problem is having too much of it. Sometimes the problem is key pieces of it are hiding. Uh, I, there's a lot of reasons. Um, it's not so hard to get maybe the first layer, but to dig down, I would say time. Uh, it's also inclination. Right? The average organizer is much more uh, oriented towards making the next phone call to get the next recruit on board than they are to poking around it in data on the, on the internet. Yeah, It's out there. It's almost always out there, but where and how to. And, and then the other piece is, the other real skill is putting it together in a way that people can understand it and use it, right, uh, in a timely manner, right? In general, how do you identify decision makers? So the decision maker <clears throat> is whoever has the power to say yes or no to the thing you want, right? And sometimes that's really obvious. Sometimes it's uh, an elected body, a legislative body, and you have to sift through, and you have to meet and figure out who's a yes, who's a no, and who's a swing. Sometimes it's more hidden. Sometimes you have to be really creative. I worked with a group a number of years ago that was trying to work on um, World Bank and debt in third world countries, debt in Africa specifically, and we had to do a bunch of research to figure out how a bunch of Americans could get power uh, and we looked into congressional committees and where the money came from, and you've got to follow trails. Speaking as an old organizer, um, how have things changed in the last 20 or 25 years now that we have the internet and, and new forms of communication? You know, um, you know, both for the good and for the bad, I would say, right? So. When we first did some research uh, about five years ago about online organizing, what we found was a lot of very unfocused, untargeted um, uh, stuff out there. Uh, I did a little work at one point with uh, change.org when they were getting these you know, 300,000 person signatures on petitions. And I can tell you that there was one particular case. Anybody remember Pink Slime? The hamburger, uh, the, the stuff, the last pieces that they s use a centrifuge and chemicals to spin off of. We don't even really want to go there any further, but disgusting stuff, stuff that they mix back into hamburger and then we're supposed to eat it. Um, and they had started the petition to get rid of it. The petition was one of the really early ones to get 300,000 signatures. Uh, I happened to talk, to, and they won within three weeks. They were asking the USDA not to sell that kind of hamburger as the only hamburger that they sold to school lunch programs to have another kind of hamburger available too. They won it in three weeks. I was doing some debriefing with them. They thought that they had won it because they had shamed the head of the USDA. And from time to time, we go through these periods of talking about shaming people. And as a person who's been doing community organizing for a long time, I can tell you that most of the people that we have to do organizing against 
are pretty shameless. So I wasn't buying it. Yeah, you shamed him. Sure, sure. I, yeah, I don't really think so. Uh, but, and by the way, what was his name? And then they couldn't name him. And so then you definitely can't shame anybody you can't name, right? But they had had 300,000 signatures, so they thought that was it. But when I kept digging around, it turned out that a bunch of those people had gone into Applebee's, TGIF's, Kroger's, and I think Ralph's, and asked to speak to the manager before they bought the hamburger, and asked if the hamburger had pink slime in it, and said they wouldn't buy it if it did. And those four chains had contacted Tom Vilsack, the head of USDA, and told him he had to do something. So it was actually not the action they thought, but it was, in fact, action that did it. So we have to, there's a, a tendency to go for simple answers. Uh, there's the, the ability to get, you know, how many millions of people turned out for women's marches all over the world, right? And that's an amazing, amazing thing that we can do. The other side can also do it, right? And then it's not even to talk about, you know, Russian hacking and Facebook and all of that. So there's good and there's bad, and the, the basic principles are still the same, the power principles and what uh, an elected official looks to when they make a decision how they're going to vote. Locally, we have more elected officials versus appointed than a lot of places, uh, judges, <laughs> metropolitan water reclamation district commissioners, and so on. Is that better for average hmm. people or worse, in your opinion? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, both, probably both. Um, what's good is it, you know, they shouldn't cover as big an area, so organizing should be easier because it's not so huge. I was just in Houston city about the same size as Chicago, um, and I told them their bean was no good. Um, and uh, they only have 15 city council people, so it's harder to get to one of those 15 than it is to get to one of our 50, so that's good. Um, on the other hand, all these levels of government and who's responsible for what gets very confusing very fast. And you can find yourself going after the wrong place or being shifted from office to office, so both, bit of both. <laughs>